what is concerned, there are few theories um, with regard to the fixed form. The first theory is classics. Okay. Passivism. So, passivism opposes war at any cost. Passivism opposes war at any cost. Okay. So, basically, the pacifists believe that a war is always wrong. A war cannot be ethically justified under any circumstance. Okay. Uh, who are the examples of pacifists? Gandhi. Okay. Ashoka. Um, Ashoka, yeah, after the Dalinga War. Okay, Martin Luther King Jr., etc. Okay. Erasmus. There was a Dutch philosopher called Erasmus. Okay, he was also a pacifist. Okay. In fact, Erasmus said that the cost of war is so great that even if you win, you lose much more than you gain. Okay. So these people basically oppose war at any cost. They said that any uh, dispute should be resolved through peaceful means, through negotiations, through discussions, through economic sanctions, etc. Okay. The war should not be resorted to at any cost. Now, what is the problem with pacifism? Okay, it's very difficult to implement in practice because there are certain situations, there are certain circumstances where war is only the only like war is the only option left. For example, uh, the Second World War. Okay, a Second World War was needed to stop Hitler and to stop the Nazis. Hitler could not have been negotiated with. He wouldn't have listened to discussions, deliberations, negotiations, or sanctions. War was the only option that was available for the allied forces. Okay. So pacifism theoretically it sounds good but it is very difficult to implement in practice. Again, on the other end of the spectrum we have amoral realism. Amoral realism. Amoral realism believes that A war is not only legitimate, but morality does not constrain war. But morality does not constrain war. Okay. So basically, they promote war. They, they in fact glorify war. They not just promote war, but they glorify war. Okay. Now within immoral radius there are two categories of people. Okay. The first category of people promote war basically for expansionist purpose. Okay. For achieving geopolitical objectives. The second category of people uh, basically promote religious war. Okay. The immoral radius are of two kinds. Those who promote and glorify war for achieving geopolitical objectives for expansionist purpose and those who promote and glorify war for religious for achieving religious ends. Okay. For example, Islamic fundamentalism. Okay. So again, these are two ends of the spectrum. On one end we have pacifism, on the other end we have oh, amoral realism. These are two extreme theories. Okay. So again, like always, the correct path is the middle path. So we have something called just war theory. So just war theory says that a war can be ethically justified under certain circumstances if certain conditions are followed. A war can be ethically justified if certain conditions are followed. Now these conditions are of three kinds okay. or these principles are of three kinds. Principles
principles governing the conduct of war or principles governing the resorting to war at first place. Pahla. The first set of principles kya hai? Principles governing resorting to war at first place. Principles governing conduct of war. Principles governing conduct of war. And third, principles governing termination of war. Principles governing termination of war and signing of peace agreements. So let us discuss these principles one by one. Pahla kya hai? Principles which should be used to resort to war at first place. Na na? Before starting a war, what are the principles that should be followed? First, just pause. Okay? Just pause means that there has to be a just cause to start a war. For example, for self-defense or for protecting innocent people from genocide, okay, or from ethnic cleansing, or for protection of human rights, okay. Second, right intention. Right intention. Right intention means intention should not be malefic. Intention of starting a war should not be malafide. For example, a war should not be fought for territorial gains or for revenge. Okay. Next. Proper authority and public declaration. Proper authority and public declaration. So basically this means that due process should be followed before starting a war. So, competent authority should declare the law. Which is the competent authority in the international context? Which is sanctioned to UNSC, United Nations Security Council. Fourth, last resort. So, what should be used only when all other Alternatives have been exhausted. Discussions, deliberations, negotiations, economic sanctions, everything has been used, then only war should be the last resort. And last, proportionality. Lastly, we have proportionality. Proportionality means that a war should be started only if the perceived benefits outweigh the perceived costs. The proper cost benefit analysis needs to be carried. Next, principles governing the conduct of war. These were principles which are to be, which are to be followed before starting a war. Second is principles governing the conduct of war. If a war start over, then what are the principles that should be followed? First, obeying all treaties and conventions. Obeying all international treaties and conventions. We have various international treaties and conventions. For example, Chemical Weapons Convention, Biological Weapons Convention. Okay, these international treaties and conventions should be followed in letter and spirit. Next, non-combatant immunity. Non-combatant. Who are non-combatants? Civilians. Okay, who do not fight the war. Okay, so civilians should not be uh, harmed during the war. Civilians should be protected. They should have immunity. Okay. Next, benevolent quarantine of prisoners of war. POWs. Benevolent. of POWs, prisoners of war and ex 
exchange of pure objects. Pure objects, business award. Okay, so during a war, POWs should not be physically or mentally tortured. They should be quarantined. Quarantine का क्या होता है? Isolated. Okay. जो भी POWs captured होंगे, all the POWs who are captured during the war, they should be quarantined. They should be isolated. They should be treated in a benevolent fashion. Okay. They should not be physically or mentally tortured. And at the end of the war, they should be exchanged. Exchange of POWs takes place. Okay. After a war. Next, proportionality. So, proportionality means that uh, disproportionate use of force should not be used. Okay, if something can be achieved using traditional methods, using conventional weapons, then weapons of mass destruction should not be used. Okay, and lastly. Evil methods, evil methods such as mass plunder, mass rape campaigns, evil methods such as mass plunder, mass rape campaigns, ethnic cleansing, etc. Should not be used during the war. Should not be used during the war. Okay. So, even methods, mass plunder. You understand plunder? Plunder? They do because there is when a war happens, the rule of law. Uh, gets broken down. Okay. For example, when wars happen in West Asia, okay, mass plunder, like uh, the criminal elements, they make use of the vacuum that exists. There is no rule of law. There is no monitoring agency. There is no regulatory body. There is no government there. Okay. Then they indulge in mass plunder campaign. Har jagah jaakar they basically loot bar, mashana. They go. They indulge in robbery, theft, etc. Similarly, mass rape campaigns also take place during the war. Ethnic cleansing takes place. Ethnic cleansing means basically killing the people of a particular community. Okay. So these things are very common. But again, as per the just war theory, then these things should not be resorted to during the war. Okay. Next, principles governing the termination of war. And signing of peace agreements. First, the peace agreement should be the peace agreement should be reasonable and moderate. It should be reasonable and moderate. It should not be vindictive. It should not be vindictive. Okay, so basically, uh, it should not be revengeful. The peace agreement, for example, Treaty of Versailles. It was a vindictive treaty. It was a vindictive peace agreement that was signed after World War One. Okay, so peace agreement should not be signed with that objective. Second, the agreement should make a distinction. Between leaders and soldiers of the defeated nation, between leaders and soldiers of the defeated nation and civilians, sweeping social economic sanctions. Sweeping socio-economic sanctions that affect civilians should be avoided.
that affects civilians should be avoided. Okay, so a distinction should be made between leaders and soldiers who are responsible for the war, who are involved in the war, and civilians. Okay. Next, it should focus on rehabilitation and reconstruction of the defeated nation. focus on rehabilitation and the construction of the defeated nation and should try to remedy and should try to remedy the wrongs that led to the war at first place. and should try to remedy the wrongs that led to the war at first place. Okay, so you should try to address the root causes that led to the war and should focus on rehabilitation and reconstruction and development of the defeated nation. Finally, leaders or soldiers Responsible for war crimes Leaders or soldiers responsible for war crimes should be tried in an objective manner R2P 
there the intervention took place by the western countries us uk and so the other nato allies okay it was ethically justified okay because most of the conditions of the sport were being followed similarly india's military intervention in maldives also India has intervened militarily in Maldives, right? Operation, Mr. Operation Cactus. Operation Cactus in 1988. Okay. So again, uh, it is it is considered to be an example of ethical military intervention because India did not have any geopolitical objective there. Okay. There, the uh, the dictator of Maldives at that time had sought Indian support, had sought India's military support. Okay. Similarly. Uh, Foreign military intervention of NATO in Yugoslavia. When an ethnic war was taking place between the Croats and the Serbs, Croatia and Serbia, which were earlier part of Yugoslavia. So again, uh, that is considered to be ethically justified. Okay. So all these are examples. India's uh, involvement in Bangladesh, in Maldives, Second World War, Yugoslavia. Second World War was also. Second World War is a war. It's not a Yugoslavia, NATO, NATO's military intervention in Yugoslavia. Okay, all these are examples of uh, foreign military interventions that can be ethically justified. Okay. Afghanistan is a grey. Okay. Afghanistan, what is the reason that the US gives? Why is it terrorism? But terrorism existed even before 2001 also. Okay. So the US started thinking about terrorism when it was attacked. So again, the intention, one of the like principles of just war is right intention. So what is what was the intention? So its intention can be questioned. Now what are the examples where such interventions cannot be ethically justified? Iraq. Iraq is a very good example of an unethical, unjustified foreign military intervention. So why did the US intervene in Iraq? Yeah, so USA basically accused that Saddam Hussein or Iraq, Iraq is developing weapons of mass destruction. Okay. However, no weapons of mass destruction were found. In fact, Iraq war is considered to be the beginning of the time period which led to instability in West Asia. Before that, West Asia was a relatively stable region. Iraq war changed everything. Okay. In fact, even rise of ISIS can be traced to Iraq war. And because of Iraq war, uh, it led to Shia Sunni conflict, etc., and which ultimately led to the rise of ISIS. Okay. Even Syria. Syria cannot be ethically justified. Okay. You have no basically sort of justification to intervene there. Okay. But US is doing it because the regime there had become unfriendly to the US. Even uh, we recently Russia's annexation of Crimea. That is also an example of unethical foreign military intervention. Okay. So again, if any question comes on the ethical issues or the ethics of such foreign military interventions, write first of all write the theory part, just what theory will your principles and then give examples. Okay, those examples where such interventions can be justified, those examples where they cannot be ethically justified. Okay? Now, economy or finance related issues. Uh, this way, the first thing is ethics of international aid and Similarly, 
presently World Bank funds a lot of developing projects, World Bank, Humanity, etc. And they have their own. For example, World Bank has its own environmental and social framework, which is to be followed for all projects which have been funded by World Bank. Okay. Now, what is the issue within that? What are the ethical issues in international internationality? What are the issues here? Capital account 
are enumerated just in simple terms, basically it relates to uh, like balance of payment, right? balance of payment. So the current account is the capital account. Okay. Capital account is what is it? Uh, not the account of a corporation, I am talking about of a nation. A nation has a balance of payment, it is a current account or capital account. Hota hai. So, current account has a balance of trade, ho gaya, balance of services, ho gaya, remittances. Ho gaya, ye sare aate hai. Capital account is investment and borrowings. These two are part of capital account. Okay? Investment and borrowings. So, capital account convertibility refers to the ease with which foreign investment and foreign borrowings can take place in an economy. Okay? It is not ease, it is not it is not liberalized uh, investment or borrowing architecture. For example, the different FDI limits jo hai, in different sectors, we have different FDI limits. It is part of capital account convertibility. We are slowly moving towards capital account convertibility by liberalizing, by liberalizing FDI norms in different sectors. Full capital account convertibility ka kya hota hai? There is 100% FDI is allowed under automatic rule in all these sectors. Now, when you are introducing economic reforms, uh, I have like one of the conditions or one of the things that I know was telling us is to go for full capital account convertibility. Okay, but we did not introduce it under the pressure of IMF. We told that our economy is not ready for full capital account convertibility. We are going to implement it at our own pace depending upon our own needs and requirements. So we adopted a very phased approach to capital account convertibility. Okay. So again, when we talk of international conditionalities, we should assess whether those conditions are in our interest, are in our long term interest or not. We should not just oppose it just because it is being imposed by somebody else. We should assess that conditionality on the basis of its merit. Okay? Yeah. So we should not commit the fallacy of ad hominem. Yeah. Okay? Okay, ethics of international conditionalities. Then ethical issues in trade negotiations, international trade negotiations. What are the ethical issues in trade negotiations? We have read about WTO and different aspects of trade negotiations that take place.
number of important decisions were taken. Okay. Uh, have you read about, have you heard about Bali package, peace clause, trade facilitation agreement? Okay. So if you haven't, please go through it. See again, these are not ethics related issues. These are general international affairs related issues. But you have to analyze it from the point of view of ethics. If this question comes in ethics, how will I approach it? What will I write? What are the ethical issues? So basically, Bali agreement it was essentially related to food security and the subsidies that developing countries such as India are given to their farmers. So as per the WTO norms, the total amount of subsidy, there are different kinds of subsidies. WTO specifies different kinds of subsidies that countries can give. Okay. Blue box subsidies, green box subsidies, amber box subsidies, etc. Okay. Now, as per the WTO norms, uh, the total amount of agricultural subsidies should not exceed 10% of the total value of agricultural output. So, this is known, known as AMS, Aggregate Measure of Support. So, total AMS, Aggregate Measure of Support, in the agricultural sector should not exceed 10% of the total value of agricultural output. Now, in India, because of our public distribution system, okay, the total uh, subsidies that the Indian government is giving to farmers, it is exceeding 10%. And in the developed countries, they say, say that it is exceeding. So, the developed view is that the developed countries wanted us to basically uh, sort of make changes in our PDS program, public distribution system program, so that uh, the AMS comes down to less than 10%. However, India did not agree. India said that food security and farmers welfare is something that is very sensitive issue and we cannot touch that. So as a middle path, something called peace clause was introduced. Okay. So the developed countries said that they agreed that okay, you continue with your PDS system, your procurement system, your food security system, etc., whatever you have. But in return, they asked for a no permanent solution of the new one. But in return, they asked for a trade facilitation agreement. Okay, trade facilitation agreement basically means developing countries had to give certain commitments with regard to development of their port infrastructure, which would facilitate international trade in terms of their regulatory clearances, etc., at ports, etc. Okay, because one of the complaints of one of the demands of developed countries was that in developing countries, the trade infrastructure is very weak. Okay. So, developed countries agreed to basically sign a peace clause which would give developing countries such as India the space and the time to continue with their public distribution system, food procurement system, etc. And in return, developing countries wanted their way, they agreed to a trade facilitation agreement. Okay. So, these are how, I mean, these are the, all the issues that are involved in international trade negotiations. Okay. So, Read about these negotiations, Doha development round, whatever is happening. I think this year again WTO meet is going to take place. Yeah. Every two years it takes place. In this year or last year? Yeah. Last year it is taking place. Okay, the next. Last year, when did it take place? Yeah. Brazil. Nairobi was before that. Yeah. So, uh, read about the negotiations, what are the interests and demands of developed countries. Uh, what are the demands and interests of developing countries? What are the ethical issues involved here? Here the main ethical issue that is involved here is equity and redistributive justice. Okay. So developed countries and developing countries cannot be treated at the same level. Okay. So that's why in all these negotiations, in all these agreements, there are special provisions for developing and underdeveloped countries. So, equity and redistributive justice is the main ethical issue. Okay. Similarly, you can also get ethics of idea, intellectual property rights, ethical issues related to intellectual property rights. In which area idea has been used in the sector of our economy? Pharmaceutical sector. 
So, what is the main ethical issue as far as IPR is concerned? Basically, uh, what the branded pharma companies they were doing that they were indulging in ever greening of patients by making incremental innovation. Okay, so they they had a patient for say 20 years. After 20 years, what they will do? They will make small tinkering, small changes to their product, and they will again reapply for patent. This is known as ever greening of patients through incremental innovation. Okay. So, few years back, the Supreme Court basically struck down this level meaning of patents by introducing the concept of compulsory licensing. Okay. So, the Supreme Court said that such level meaning of patents for incremental innovation cannot be allowed. Okay. And the court allowed generic drug manufacturing companies to uh, continue manufacturing these drugs. Okay, the board gave compulsory licensing to these generic drug manufacturing companies in larger public interest. Okay. So again, the grievances or the complaints of developed countries that India has a weak IPR framework which hampers R&D and innovation. Okay. Whereas developing countries say that health is something that is, health sector is something that is non-negotiated. Okay. In larger public interest, larger interest of public health, okay, uh, compulsory licensing can be given. In fact, I mean, which is the WTO agreement which governs IPR? TRIPS, Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights. So, in the TRIPS also there is a provision that of compulsory licensing in larger public interest. So, India is not violating international agreement. Okay, that is India's argument. Okay. So again, you need to realize that the basic conclusion on any question related to IPR would be that IPR is not an end in itself. Intellectual property rights are a means to achieve something. It cannot be an end in itself. Okay. So in larger public interest, uh, IPR needs to be balanced with issues of public interest, public health, etc. See again, all these are, I told you that, all these are GS related issues, I have to paper 3 in the But again, whenever you are reading these things, keep in mind the ethical and what are the ethical issues. Okay, now environmental issues. The reason you are in the question is that you have to have, how far is it justified? So you just give arguments for, arguments against and a balanced conclusion. Arguments for receiving the aid, arguments against receiving the aid and a balanced conclusion. Arguments for, so because it's a calamity situation, resource crunch there. So we should accept any help that is coming from any corner of the world. Okay. But again, uh, earlier India used to Take, you know, but our experience has not been good. After the tsunami, the tsunami, the tsunami, the tsunami, we used to take it. Uh, I think the safer stance here would be to say that uh, we should not take it. Because we have the internal resources. Already, see, internally only today only I was reading that people only have donated more than 700 crore. And uh, through all these online donations and all, more than 700 crore has been collected. That is much more than what UAE was offering. It was offering 600 crore. So, India 600 crore. It has come with that. And later it's going to come. Officially, we don't announce the government's immunity. Whatever, whether it was right or not. Okay. Uh, so again, see, uh, we have to take a long term view. Today, we can take the money, no problem. Okay. Tomorrow, what will be its implications? Tomorrow, UAE might try to use it for its advantage. Then we are holding international discussions.
discussions, negotiations, deliberations on any issue, then this might come up. See, because in international affairs, there are no free lunches. Try to understand that. UAE has to be bring it as a media. It has, it has some hidden objectives. And there is nothing wrong in it. In international affairs, everybody is concerned about their interests. So UAE would leverage it, would use it at some point or the other. So uh, keeping in mind a long-term perspective, it is not advisable to take aid from other countries. Especially now that we have the resources. Our civil society is so active, civil society has contributed so much. Central government is also giving funds, although the states keep on demanding more. Chai wo central government kitna bhi de, kuto states ka kaam hai demand kar. Okay. But I think we have the resources to deal with such calamities at present. Okay. Ethics of climate change. Was environmental issue mein the issue the ethical issue here is ethics of climate change. What are the ethical issues in climate change? When climate change negotiations take place, what are the ethical issues that are raised by developing countries, developed countries, etc.? Climate change refugees. Climate refugees. Okay. Spirit 
they are similar, but the nomenclature has been changed. So INDC stands for Intended National Indigenous Contributions. So developed countries were saying that <coughs> till the time countries such as India and China, who are huge greenhouse gas emitters, they also contribute in dealing with climate change. Okay, no substantive results can be achieved. Earlier, what was the framework as part of Kyoto Protocol? <coughs> you have read about Kyoto Protocol? So earlier, as part of Kyoto Protocol, uh, all the countries were divided into three groups. Annex 1 country, Annex 1 country, Annex 2 countries and non-Annex country. Annex 1 countries were all the developed countries who had binding targets. They had to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as compared to a baseline level by a certain percentage. Okay. Non-annexed countries were mostly developing and underdeveloped countries who did not have any binding targets. Now, as part of INDCs, developing countries such as India and China, they have agreed to certain contributions. Although again, they are not legally binding. It's a voluntary determined contribution. Okay. For example, as part of India, the what are India's INDCs? As part of our INDCs, India has agreed to reduce our emission intensity of GDP by 33 to 35 percent. Okay. Then increase the share of renewable energy to 40 percent. Okay. Uh, create a carbon sink of additional 3 million ton of CO2 equivalent through afforestation. All these are our INDCs. Okay, so the first issue is this CBDR, RC and INDCs. Then growth versus sustainability. Okay, how to balance growth related with growth related issues with sustainability issues. Or theoretical issue? Green for carbon intelligent for balance. So all these are issues to balance growth and sustainability. ISA, green funds, REDD plus, REDD. Okay, so these are all international initiatives, international funds to balance, to basically promote sustainable development. Okay, so growth or sustainability for the issue also promote at an international level, a number of things have been done. Uh, we have sustainable development goals, SDGs have been formulated from 2004, like for the period 2015 to 2030. Okay, international solar alliance is there, we have convention on biological diversity, technology transfer, finance trans financial transfers, these are the things that to balance growth and sustainability. The third major issue with climate change is intergenerational equity. Okay, the third major ethical issue. Intergenerational equity. How do you define sustainable development? What is the definition of sustainable development? Because whatever you do now, 
it's not, its impact is not going to be seen in the next few years. Its impact is going to be seen after two decades. Okay. So uh, there is no incentive for the present generation to adopt the path of sustainable development so as to leave adequate resources for the future generation. You understand? It's like a party. A party has started and all the people who have come first, they have eaten all the food and nothing is left for the people who are going to come later. So there is an equity issue here, intergenerational equity. Okay. We, we have to decide what kind of world we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. Okay. And the last ethical issue here is commercialization of pollution. Commercialization of pollution. Now, as part of Kyoto Protocol, there were certain flexibility mechanisms. You have read about flexibility mechanisms under Kyoto Protocol? If, like Annex 1 countries, they had binding targets, if they were not able to fulfill those targets, there were certain flexibility mechanisms that were provided to them. Okay? For example, joint implementation, clean development mechanism. So, as part of, for example, joint implementation, say, if the US is not able to fulfill its greenhouse gas emission target, what it will do? It will invest in some other country in annex, it will invest in some other annex one country. Okay? And it will reduce greenhouse gas emission there. Similarly, as part of clean development mechanism, some annex one country invests in non-annex country, developing countries, such as India. Who here invest here, here they will reduce the greenhouse gas emission. Okay? So, these are known as flexibility mechanisms. Now, what is the issue with these flexibility mechanisms? Countries will make use of them. Some countries will make use of them. It was introduced so that some countries would make use of them. So, use of the city resources for the proper system of monetary. No, monetary is a developing country would also benefit. They are getting investment now. It's not like uh, they are exploiting us. Okay, they have invested here, they have helped us in developing some green technology. And because of that, whatever greenhouse gas emissions have reduced, they will show as part of their. So it's a win win situation for both. They are also benefiting, we are also benefiting. There is no problem in that. But they will they will level of pollution. Yeah. They will change. Yeah, so basically it leads to commercialization of pollution. So basically what you are saying is that, okay, I am not able to reduce my pollution, I will invest in your country, you reduce your pollution. So through such market mechanisms, through such market instruments, you are basically removing the stigma associated with pollution. Are you understand? Okay, they are continuing to do that thing, they are just paying monetary through monetary investment. Okay. So, Again, all the countries have to basically take responsibility. You cannot say that, okay, I am going to give you money and I will continue to pollute. This is commercialization of pollution. Okay. So that is another issue with uh, the manner in which we are dealing with climate change at present. The manner, the, like issue with the present market mechanisms, flexibility mechanisms, okay, that existed in global world. So all these are ethical issues in climate change. CBDR, RC, ITDCs, growth versus sustainability, intergenerational equity and commercialization of the okay. The last topic that we have to discuss here is moral roots of India's foreign policy. See, we are done with the applied part. Okay, we discussed various things. We discussed ethics of war, drone attacks, ethics of foreign military interventions, ethics of international aid conditionalities, IPR related issues, climate change, etc. Again, keep your eyes and ears open. Whenever you are reading anything in IR, you can think from the point of view of ethics also. If this question comes in ethics, either as part of case study or as part of theory, how do you approach it? For example, the refugee crisis should open. It's an international affairs issue, IR issue. Okay. India maybe it has been in news. Why it has been in news? In India? 